Welcome to episode 184 of Tim Talk, the podcast about the DC animated universe, co-created by Bruce Tim. I'm Chris Lord. I'm Cameron Dexter. And we're back this week with some more Justice League. Uh, a couple episodes that I was really, really looking forward to, uh, which is Hereafter Parts 1 and 2, a.k.a. the DCAU's version of the death of Superman. Yes, and you warned me beforehand not to right, get it yes. spoiled for myself. <laughs> I, I warned you not to let me spoil it for you. Yes, but little did I know... I have already seen these episodes. You had seen them before. My past okay. self had spoiled them for me. Oh, okay. So then at what point did you realize you had seen this before? Uh, when Toy Man came out. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I for some reason, I always thought this was an, an unlimited episode. Mm-hmm. And I thought there were more side characters that were popping up. And I don't know why. Because I guess I, I guess I was thinking it was closer to the actual Death of Superman story arc. Okay, yeah. Or like we were getting the other members coming in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I just remembered the Batman plot because Batman just not wanting to accept that he's actually dead. Yeah. I did not remember that there were other villains in there. I did not even think about Lobo. I completely forgot about <laughs> that part of the story. I mean, it kind of speaks to how good these episodes are that Lobo shows up and you you don't remember him being there. Like, he blends into the episodes because so much else happens. Yeah, so much happens. Yeah. There's so many villains. Yes. I mean, this is, you know, this is JLU before JLU. This is exactly yeah. what we've wanted. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, I'm just going to say this without actually backing this up. I think this is the most appearances, even if it's just a cameo appearance, in terms of other heroes oh, and villains. Oh, absolutely. Which which makes sense. It's Superman's funeral. A lot of people are going to show up there. Yeah, um, and there's we'll, a, a very long list online that I didn't write down, assuming you would write it down. I didn't write it down, but I have the page open. Okay. So we can take a look at it. So we'll get into that when we get into the actual funeral itself. Um, but should we go ahead and just dive in? Oh, I guess, I guess there was one piece of news this week. Was it there? Um, they've cast Supergirl. I did see that. Yeah, uh, the Supergirl is going to be appearing in the Flash. Andy Muschietti's The Flash. Yes, uh, along it with may or may not be happening sometime in the next ten years. Yeah, I mean at this or point, could already be out for all we know. Everyone's going to be in that movie. Um, it definitely makes it seem like not only is it going to be a Flashpoint film, but it's going to be like maybe DC's attempts to try and fix their random problems through all of this. I mean, that's what we've been saying since 2016, Chris. Yeah, but the evidence just keeps stacking up. I mean, look, I'm super excited for there to be a Supergirl. Uh, and so the the actress cast is uh, Sasha Call, Call or Callie, I'm not sure. Um, not really familiar with her, but looks cool. Very exciting. It's always cool, especially when someone relatively unknown gets cast in one of these roles. Mm-hmm. I think now Supergirl carries enough weight and enough recognition as a character that they can cast someone relatively unknown and not have to rely on the actor to sell the movie. They'll rely on the character yes. to sell the movie. And so it's exciting. I don't know what that movie is going to be. It's probably going to be a mess as everything else that comes out of DC and Warner Brothers. Maybe it'll has also been. be four hours. I got I hope not. <laughs> they don't need any more of my time they're getting. Uh, but I think that's just exciting. Nonetheless, that she got cast. So I think that was it in terms of news, right? Uh, sure. Let's just say it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of other shit happening in the world. Let's just say that's it in terms of anything pertinent to the podcast. So let's go ahead and dive into some hereafter. Uh, and so in part one, we see that the Superman Revenge Squad, yes, that's an actual thing from the comics, uh, teams together and they kill Superman in battle. And then the League must deal with the aftermath of his death. There's not a lot of plot, really, in this first part. It's basically just that setup. He dies and then it's the aftermath of what happens. But I think... By having such a limited plot, there's a lot of room for great character stuff in here. Yes. So why don't we start off by talking about the Revenge Squad itself. So the Revenge Squad is an actual group in the comics. I I guess it's maybe Superman's equivalent of the Sinister Six. Okay. Is how I might describe it. It's usually made up of a bunch of different characters. I think maybe some of these characters have appeared at some point in the comics, but usually it's started by Morgan Edge and filled with other random people. Um, But in this iteration, we get uh, Metallo, Toyman, and Weather Wizard, um, notably not voiced by their original actors here. I don't know if you caught that. I did not. Yeah. Um, It's definitely not Malcolm McDowell doing Metallo, and it's not Bud Court doing uh, Toyman either. It's Corey Burton doing all three, who who does like a fine job filling in. I mean, I didn't notice. Okay. I definitely noticed, but I've got that. Well, I also was having to Google how to spell Calabac. 
a okay. few times. <laughs> Wait, how do you spell Calabac? I don't know. <laughs> I have it K-L-I-B-A-K. Is that right? I don't know. I have it spelled three different ways in my notes. <laughs> uh, oh, mine is right, actually. Okay. K-L-I-B-A-K. All right, all um, mine are wrong. Yeah, but at least that was still Michael Dorn coming back to voice Calabac. And then uh, Livewire this time was just voiced by Maria Canals, who voices Hot Girl. So Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, I think it's a good collection of villains. They all have, you know, uh, a hatred of Superman from various Superman animated series episodes. Yeah. What What's interesting is it starts off with this core, but then Volcana comes in just a little bit. Because they, they explain that, like, they break people out of prison. Yeah. So in But part, I, I'm surprised they don't get Volcana for this part. In part one, it's just this collection. And then in part two, I think they've busted people out of Striker. Yeah, we see Volcana and Copperhead join and the crew. And Deadshot. And Deadshot, that's right. Exactly. I'll join in there as well. So, But th- this initial team is a little bit smaller. Um, it's, you know, obviously a big fight ensues, but the, the major point that happens in all of this is that Toy Man has this giant walker that, you know, looks like a kid's toy with a big cannon in its chest, um, but it shoots out some sort of energy beam that apparently just disintegrates whatever it comes in contact with. Mm-hmm. So it's taken out, like, chunks of the street. It's taking out cars um and then eventually it takes out superman himself (gasps) gasp but even the way like that whole fight happens i really enjoyed like i don't maybe i was just thinking about it because last week was all about how the team doesn't always work well together but i Mm -hmm. felt like they were fighting as a team well they're working well together this time around i yes i i have this thought where like last week i think the villains were more in sync Mm-hmm. because they had Grodd as kind of the central figurehead. Oh, yeah. Whereas this week, there's no real teamwork happening between these villains. No. You don't really see Weather Wizard and, um, like, Live Wire combining strengths to make, like, a huge electric storm, which they probably could. They very easily That probably could. could be a really cool team-up move. Yeah. Um, or Calabac just only throwing cars his only move is to throw cars (laughs) but he's so good at it he's so good at it those animators love just drawing the same generic model to get smashed over and over again yeah save some time save some budget yeah uh but i mean yeah talking about that the league is also smart because they know metallo is there Mm -hmm. hiding somewhere which is what they should have known with parasite but they didn't (laughs) they've learned their lessons they they've learned yes um And so Superman is really holding back for the league to really clean up his villains until they can get Metallo out of the way so he can go in safe, Mm -hmm. which is so contradictory to what he was doing last week. (laughs) Again, they've learned he's less of an asshole this time around. Yes. But look, it's a good fight. There's some fun moments thrown in there. Um, I particularly like when Calabac is fighting with Batman and Batman's completely getting the best of him, including just grabbing him by the arm and, like, using his own momentum to throw him. Yeah. Like, this is someone on... He's not... I don't know if he's necessarily considered, like, a on par with the new gods. But, I mean, he's Dark Side son. Like, this is a very powerful being. He's kind of an idiot. And to your point, he can only throw cars. But going up against Batman, like, it should be a quick fight, but, of course, it's not. And right. I, I love that whole interplay. And the fact that Batman's not actually trying to fight him, he's just stalling. And then Superman coming, yeah. and being the good friend that he is. <laughs> like, even if I wasn't here, Batman would still probably win. Batman still could have taken, yeah. 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 No, I mean, it, it's fun to watch it all play out. Like, there's that um, there's that great moment when Weather Wizard calls down, like, a, a big-ass lightning storm, and Wonder Woman blocks it with her bracelets and flashes. It's just like, there are so many reasons why that shouldn't have worked. Yeah. <laughs> But it's it's fun. Like it, it's a good fight sequence. It's you know got a lot of action in there. It's got some fun lines. Um, but obviously, like the the big moment at the end is when um, Toy Man aims his weapon at Batman and Wonder Woman, and Superman step like flies in and intercept it, and vanishes. seemingly yeah vanishes. Like we we see him kind of like flash almost like an X ray. We see a skeleton, and then he and anything else inside the the sphere disappear. And it's like oh he's dead. He's absolutely, well, everyone thinks he's dead at least. Yeah, he's gone. Yeah, he's gone. And then, you know, the, so this was written by Dwayne McDuffie, and I think you can tell because the writing it is so good. But it's a really emotional moment. Like everything just sort of stops and pauses, and then like a storm comes in and it's raining. 
And it's really intense and dramatic. And everyone, including the villains to some degree, don't know how to react to this. Like, they set out to kill Superman. And they did it. And they did it. But, like, did they, any of them actually expect it to work? No. Yeah. 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 What do you do after that? Yeah. Break all your friends out of prison. I, I guess. guess so. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, yeah. Because then you see Wonder Woman come in and, you know, with tears mixed in with the raindrops. Yeah. Picks up Toy Man ready to kill him. Yeah. She says she's going to punch <laughs> through his skull yeah which she could yep. very easily very easily probably could. made a cheap plastic yeah um and then flash has to stop her and be like no don't do it because of the code do it because that's what superman would do yeah exactly you know he says you know we don't do that to our enemies speak for yourself is one of them is responding he's like well no i'm trying to speak for superman yeah which i think is important that flash is the one saying this yeah because he's the one that died in the alternate reality which caused Superman to go over the edge. I actually hadn't thought about that, but it's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. That he, he is the conscious of the league in some ways. Um, but I, and we've talked about this a little bit, but I think he's also the only one who recognizes that they're all heroes, like really, really understands that. And I think he's the only one amongst them that really looks up to the other, the rest, like they're heroes, like almost like he's a bit of an outsider yeah to some degree like he just has his powers and he does what he thinks is right but he's a jokester he's more on the lighthearted side we i mean yeah flash has so because there's an other whole there's oh my gosh there's a whole other side to that concept where he's also been under scrutiny in the public eye true he yeah. knows people are always watching yeah so if they see wonder woman do this that's you know that's the end of the league mm -hmm. it's like he understands hey one, don't do this because of Superman. Two, don't do this because we're being watched all the time. Yeah. We can't show any kind of blemish ever. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, put him down gently. <laughs> Just set him on the ground. Yeah. I'll go get a pillow. I'll, I'll put it under. Yeah. He's a weird sociopath in a mask. Just, just let him be. Yeah. At the moment. But, I mean, I think... It's interesting then to see how everyone reacts. And obviously we get we get kind of brief moments of some of the league, and then we get a little bit more with the Flash, who um, is probably the most vocal of anyone in terms of expressing how hard this hits him, right? You know, he even says, you know, I used to be able to goof around so much because I knew Superman had my back. Now all I've got is his example, and that's just gonna have to be enough. Um, again, like showing he has the heart amongst all of them. And just he got so many great lines in this episode. Yeah. Um, I imagine this must have been a really fun episode for Michael Rosenbaum, who normally gets to do all the, like, the jokes and stuff, but here he actually gets to throw a little bit of dramatic weight into the lines. Um, but obviously, he's really hard, and then I think Batman's the most interesting. Right, yeah. Like I said, that's the only story arc that I remember from mm -hmm. this two-parter. Yeah. Because he's essentially in denial. He refuses to believe that Superman's dead. His justification is basically the conservation of matter, that he can find no evidence of anything that was taken out by the blast from toy man he's like collected all of the pieces of the crime scene it's gone through all of them there's no burn marks no ashes no scorching no nothing it's no just radiation some, yeah. right yeah something was there and then it's gone and so from his perspective that means that wh whatever was in there must exist somewhere some place he just doesn't know what um and that's just the way he's logically trying to cope with this because you know you can tell like it hits him i mean this is a guy who his whole life is built around grieving the loss of someone that he cared about. Mm -hmm. And although he would never say it to Clark's face, he definitely cared about Clark. Um, you know, even the point of refusing to go to the funeral, he's like, no, why would I go there? I, I'm busy. Yeah. And also I know he's not dead. So yeah. what's the point of, yeah, grieving. Yeah. Why, why am I going to bother with this? <laughs> um, but I, and I love too, they brought Alfred back for mm -hmm. that scene. I think Alfred's the only character in the entire DCAU that could have that conversation with Bruce. Maybe Dick to some degree, but I think Bruce is more likely to just kind of brush him aside and dismiss, where he never really dismisses Alfred in that same kind of way. He never talks down to Alfred. Well, and Alfred's also the one that was there when his parents died. Yeah. And so he also knows how to console. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. his role his whole life. Yeah, it's all he's done, basically, that and stitch Batman costumes together. Yeah. But no, it's it's a really touching moment. It's nice, of course, they brought back Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., who just, he's always so great. I love whenever they bring Alfred back. Um, and yeah, it, it's a really heartfelt moment of Alfred being like, you probably should still go to this funeral just in case. And Bruce is like, nope, not going to bother with it. Um, well, we do kind of see that he's 
kind of there. Yeah, he watches the funeral procession. Um, from the shadows. Yeah, from the rooftops, from the shadows. Cause, and that, that makes sense. Like, He's also not the kind of guy that's going to go and like sit in a church in a pew in his Batman costume. I wish he would, though. <laughs> Boy, do I wish he would. I mean, at this point, half Metropolis has seen him. He was at that baseball or the football game yeah. against Rod. So, yeah. But, I mean, even if he's not there, there are plenty of other people at that funeral. Including Lex. Yeah, that's a big moment. Um, you know, everyone's kind of assembled and there's this gasp and Lex walks through and, and Lois comes out and slaps him. It's like, how dare you be here? And obviously taking out her, her grief on him. But even he says, you know, despite what you may think, I'm going to miss him too. Yeah. Hard enough that's actually sincere coming from Lex. And I, I think it is because there is that, I don't want to call it camaraderie. <laughs> it's much worse <laughs> than that. But, it, you know, it's it's the same thing with, like, the death of Batman when, yeah. like, all the villains show up. And it's like, you know, like, he did try and help us. And Joker shows up. And he's like, yeah. he was the reason I was here. Yeah, I think, was it The Man Who Killed Batman, I think, was the Beatons episode? Yeah, 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 the yeah. Joker says something almost the same effect of, like, what what do I do? And I mean, there is something to that. The existence of Superman trying to defeat Superman has been such a huge part of Lex's life for years at this point. Yeah, and also, you know, compare it to Red Sun. Mm, where yeah. he spends his entire existence knowing he can take out Superman, but he kind of doesn't because he enjoys the game too much. Right, yeah, exactly. It is a game. It's just a game for him. Yeah. Um, but no, it's it's a nice it's like, moment. Isn't that just great billionaire privilege? It really, it really is. But like the whole... The whole funeral is a nice moment. And, you know, John Jean gives a eulogy and, and it's fine. But again, it's it's even some of the just the visual beats that happen. And part of it is just the number of people we see there. So it's obviously yeah. the whole league, except for, to your point, Batman kind of watching from the shadows. Um, a number of Green Lanterns are there, too, to pay their respects. Orion is there. Mom, Pa, Kent are there being comforted by uh, Supergirl and then Lana, too, next yep. to them. Um Supergirl not wearing her wig. Right, her exactly. Hair. Yeah. Which I yeah, I guess we don't know if this point she still puts on the disguise or yeah. not. Who who even knows? But yeah, like Aquaman is there. Uh, um, Fate and his his lady. Inza. Thank you. Yeah. So I mean there, there's a bunch of people there to all kind of pay their respects. And I I found kind of right from the point when Superman disappears, basically through this whole sequence like very very emotional like it, it got me kind of emotional worked up a little bit as watching it it's just a very sincere tribute to this character but you know, obviously all these people have loved him because they've known him for years but even as an audience it's kind of the same thing and, and even though we know it's superman it's a comic book character one who's notorious for coming back from the dead and also it's a children's cartoon at the end of the day like they're not very likely to kill off their main justice leaguer maybe outside of batman yeah it's just in that moment even though you know he's coming back it's just the outpouring of love that i think i found so emotionally effective right here and, and this is what i always remember from the episode what i always found so endearing about it was how sweet and sincere and heartfelt this whole section of the episode is mm -hmm. it's really it's really really touching i don't know i don't know if you were affected by it well i'm numb right You're now <laughs> i'm medicating myself to be numb <laughs> for for the for for the time being right i suppose that's true i i have in the last you know couple of years like discovered an inner emotional core to me that i had ignored for so many years that's now really affected by things like superman dying in a kid's cartoon <laughs> so, well, so what we're going to talk about kind of at the end of this episode <laughs> is the other time superman has died quote unquote yeah large air quotes around the word death exactly um uh, and kind of how the world reacts to it mm -hmm. every time it happens. Yeah, because we don't... Spoiler, he's died 10 times. He dies, he dies a lot. Because we don't... We don't see... I think there's a good amount of fallout from his death here. I mean, most of the rest of the episode, basically half this episode is just dedicated to what happens after Superman dies. Mm -hmm. I've always been intrigued by, like, what happens to the whole world when that happens. And we can get into that when we talk about the, the other deaths of Superman. But here it's basically just we have this funeral. Everyone's really sad about it. And then the League starts figuring out, well, what happens next? Like, what do we do next? Do we bring in another member? Mm -hmm. And of course, initially they asked Batman, like, hey, do you want to come on full time? He's like, right. I forget that he's not a, a technical member. Yeah. He's basically just if you need me. He's freelance. I will. I will show up. Yeah. yeah. When you when you need me, I'll be here. Yeah. Well, because he knows freelance gets the biggest checks. It's true. Yeah. I mean, 
Although he pays for everything, so yes. maybe he's writing himself a check? Of course he is, because <laughs> Bruce is writing Batman a check. That's true, but Batman doesn't pay taxes. No. Although I bet you, I bet you, at some point in the 1960s TV show, Batman makes a comment about how he, as Batman, pays taxes. So, funny enough, there's actually a TikTok trend going on right now. Oh, God. About P- I know, because it's the start of tax season, where it's uh, members of the IRS, like, revealing superheroes because they can tell <laughs> based on what they're paying for <laughs> as a secret identity right and what because it started with like someone doing a joke about doing joker's taxes mm-hmm. and it's like how could you do that for this guy he's like he has outstanding bookkeeping like <laughs> it, like of course i don't believe in what he's doing but like it's amazing how detailed this man is yeah okay, and, that... I, and i'm not gonna say no to him are you gonna say no to him that is a clever idea I'm I'm happy with you telling me about it and me not watching it because yeah, because that's all you need to understand about <laughs> yeah. it. I have no tolerance for yeah, TikTok it's, whatsoever. It's, it's expanded to be like, who is this Peter Parker kid? Why is a 14 year old doing taxes? <laughs> it's like, well, because Spider Man is 18. It's like Peter Parker's Spider. No, he's a kid. Spider Man's an adult. That's why it's Spider Man. It's not yeah. Spider Boy. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> But yeah, so the league starts figuring out what do we do, and a number of names are thrown around. Like, oh, is it Aquaman? Um, John Stewart's like, hey, what about Metamorpho? And while they're debating it, Lobo just the smashes man, it. the main man. Lobo just smashes through. Like, oh, hey, I'm here. What about me? And everyone's like, nah. Yeah. Why? But, yeah, I mean, it's 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 an interesting point, especially in their grieving state. No one really makes great decisions. No. <laughs> so even then, they're like, yeah, you you're not going to join the team, but also we're going to take you along for this one fight. Yeah, well, because while he's fighting them to prove that he's worthy of joining the league, then, of course, you know, the prison break happens. And so now all of the, uh, the Superman Revenge Squad, plus some of the aforementioned additional villains, Volcana, Copperhead, Deadshot, are basically just wreaking havoc because they can, which is, like, understandable and stupid at the same time. Like, it's understandable, like, hey, we're celebrating the death of Superman. Um, we're basically just going to rub it in your guys' faces as basically we can. But also ignoring the fact that there is an actual literal league of other superheroes who have all kicked their asses before who are just going to jump in and take them down again. Yeah, it's kids on a sugar high. Yeah, it's like, what what do you intend to achieve by all of this? Like, honestly, Batman can take them all down single-handedly. But he doesn't. I mean... That's the thing. No, I guess he doesn't. He doesn't. Because he tries to take them on single-handedly. Yeah. He, he holds his own. For yeah. a good amount of time before the rest of the league shows up. He, uh, yeah, so what is his number? You think, like, how many... Because there's, what, it's Calabac, Volcana, Livewire, uh, Copperhead, uh, Deadshot. There's is, like, it, there's, is it just the five? I don't know. There's, like, between five and ten. Okay. There's more than were before. So I, I would say four is his, like, sweet spot, mm-hmm. where he can take out four v. one pretty easily. Yeah. But once you get into like that five, six, seven, that's when he's like, and he kind of just jumps in. He's not using stealth. He's in the middle of the street. He's not in a warehouse. He's not in his element. There's that's no, true. Yeah. there's no giant containers of acid <laughs> flanking him on any side. That's true. Batman is at his best when he's just in the middle of a warehouse. Yeah. So, <laughs> so many like nooks and crannies and corners for him to hide in. Yeah. He can just throw a battering and break some light bulbs, cast even more shadows. Yeah. It's perfect you're right yeah he's in his second worst environment the worst of course being a bright lit football field yes the second worst being just the middle of a street yeah so i i give him a little sympathy yeah. for not being able to defeat six to eight villains <laughs> but it's fine the rest of the league shows up to help including lobo who mostly just fights calabac and throws a bunch of cars on top yeah of him. it's a car fight yeah it's something they're both really good at he they should just like start up lobo his own like a uh, derby <laughs> he would be good at it he'd be very good at it be very good at it. i mean to be fair superman did tell him to leave earth alone which he did like this is the first time we've seen him since the main man way back in superman and technically he doesn't actually come to earth he goes and harasses the league of the watch right, Tower. He's, he's in orbit yeah and then he, they invite him to come with him so he did basically keep his word to superman yeah because because the other half of that is leave all earthlings alone yeah calabac notoriously not an earthling this is true and he doesn't touch anybody else this is very true <laughs> see he is a man of his word he is yeah he should join the league he has his own weird sense of honor mm-hmm. who, who one appreciates 
But yeah, so they eventually, of course, they just take down everyone as you would expect them to. And then, you know, Will was like, hey, see, who needs Superman when you have me? And of course, everyone's like, oh, Star Sapphire. That's the other one I kept forgetting. Great. My favorite. Um, How could I? Yeah. And then, you know, Lobo, like, hey, like, who needs Superman when you have me? And everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Superman just died. We're all sad. But don't worry. So the very final tease of the episode is Superman buried under rubble on some strange planet with a red sun. Um, just napping out. Yep. So don't worry. He's coming back. And I have a lot of questions about this next part. <laughs> what do you mean you have a lot of questions? Well, so I have I have two central questions. Mm-hmm. One is revolving around facial hair and the <laughs> it, the speed it grows. Fair. Uh, and two, we'll we'll get to it when we when you know I'm just gonna bring it up now and bring it up. So we we. Now know that he's in the future. Yes. He's with Vandal Savage. He's the well, last. Why don't we set up a little bit for those who may not know okay, exactly fine, what we're talking fine. about. So, yeah. So, so now Superman is stranded on some weird planet with a red sun, which means his powers no longer work. But he can still pick up a Justice League signal way, way, way off in the distance. Mm-hmm. So he's going to travel uh, by car across. This and by uh, sled dogs. Team, eventually by sled dog team. <laughs> yep. Uh, across this barren wasteland, and eventually he finds what is, in fact, the crashed remains of the Watchtower, which at some point fell out of orbit. And while there, he meets Vandal Savage and discovers that he's actually on Earth, uh, like tens of thousands of years in the future. They planted the apes dust. Uh, yeah, because at some point, apparently only like two months or so after Superman died, quote unquote, uh, Savage gets a hold of some weird like gravity changing thing and then it causes the world to get destroyed the league is killed um and then basically the whole world dies and he's been alone on earth for did you say like thirty thousand years thirty thousand years yeah or something like that uh but gave him a lot of time for some introspection yeah uh this is a very weird uh very self-aware much more uh humble version of vandal savage than we've seen in the past it it, it you almost see him like trying to stay gripped to reality yeah because he's been alone for so long and you ha- he has these flips of very introspective moments and then it's flipped with like do you want to come over and have lunch yeah <laughs> or him walking through like old metropolis that he's rebuilt and, and started to reconstruct from mm-hmm. the ruins and him having this pleasant conversation with superman and then pausing and it's like oh yeah and this is where i killed green lantern mm-hmm. you, remember, you remember green lantern like I killed him right here. Your friend? Yeah, because obviously for Vandal, that's 30,000 years ago. Yeah. And he's kind of reflected on his own and, and dealt with the grief. But for Superman, that is anywhere from 12 hours to a month ago. Yeah. I, let, let's let's get into the facial hair thing because you're right. So he, he arrives, what we eventually come to realize is the, the distant future. And so he takes basically like an old Chevy convertible like a bell or yeah, something well, like one that. of the other cars that was also sent in the future yes, with him exactly one of the things that was teleported uh inadvertently by toy man who i guess never quite understood the technology he had built yes um so he intended to disintegrate things but actually catapult them so superman loads up with gas and uh, and goes and drives off and it definitely seems like the first time he makes a camp would be his first night making a camp yeah but he has a week's worth of beard it's it's a full beard at that point yeah so so with that because that's another point they do bring up that superman was never an actual boy scout while being called a boy scout right and it shows but he was a farmer remember no yes i agree with that yeah i i meant he's not good at rationing oh okay where he uses all of his flares to make a sword i mean i guess sword is important like a weapon is very much important but like all of your flares i think there was a handful left but he used the majority of them to fashion himself a sword which he needed because there's these weird which i don't think flares get hot enough to melt whatever metal he i assume steel i don't know that's not a question for us maybe if there's enough of them i don't know i barely (laughs) remember science anymore so but i mean he needs he needs a sword because there's these weird like wolf hound dog yes fox things uh that are slowly hunting him as he traverses the planet and eventually he gets into a, a pretty sweet wolf fight and uh kills one of them K- yeah kills the leader of the pack goes fully in yeah in the exactly gray. <laughs> ties a bunch of broken bottles to his fingers starts punching away um and then he like yeah he fashions a, a very nice coat for himself out of the skin of the uh, the leader of the pack and then wrangles the which rest just of happens him. to also be the same color as his red cape 
perfect. That he dropped. Yeah, accidentally. it's absolutely perfect. Uh, yeah, and then he uses the rest to form a slug dog team to get him the rest of the way once the uh, the car runs out of gas. Yes, it's it's a little bit silly. I think overall, I, I love it. It's Honestly, fun. It's I I made the comparison before. This is Conan the Barbarian with Superman. Yeah. It's just so different from anything we've seen him do before. And look, I, I agree with you on the beer thing. Like where, how long was he doing this? I'm kind of on board with it because we get daddy Superman, which as the more we watch the show, the more I'm like, oh, okay, apparently this is a thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, did we think what a month, how, like how, how long do you think he would need to grow as like thick of a beard as he has? Well, so that, that is, is my question mm-hmm. is we know he has near super speed. Or his own version, not as, as as good as the Flash, but he has super right. speed. Okay. So I have this thought where it just grows that much every day, <laughs> but he has the speed to just constantly go and keep shaving <laughs> back and forth between missions, and that's why he's always <laughs> like a little late to everything. I mean, we, we've seen how he shaves is he uses his heat vision in a mirror. Yeah. And he's fast enough to just like run away from a fight or like between changing out of Superman costume and going back to Daily Planet just to pop by and give himself a quick trim yeah is that like an inherent ability wait okay hang on do you think that's inherent to kryptonians they grow their like facial hair super fast or is it only because he has powers well so zod has a soul patch right um it depends on the version yeah i think he had a he had a proper beard in at least the uh the richard donner films okay yeah the ones i haven't seen exactly (laughs) so the best reference point for me to pull here (laughs) I guess in my head, I, I, because we just saw Savage, I, I am just implanting Savage's face on Zod. Yeah, but it, it's similar facial hair. I think not, not as much sideburn. No, I don't think so. Mutton chop. Yeah. Also, what, what is going on with Vandal Savage? Like, do you notice the animation? He's got like two weird like bumps, like bet- between his chin and his mouth. Did you notice this? I let me pull up the picture real quick. I don't know what is going on there. I'm not sure what it's trying to emulate like it almost looks like dimples or maybe maybe it's trying to like heighten his sense of chin oh it's his lower lip is that his lower lip yeah those, those two weird upside down triangles yeah it, it's basic because neanderthal had you know the mouth is a little oh, bigger so oh. it's yeah the the it's it's accentuating the lower jaw a little bit so it, it's making his bottom lip look more protruded okay in comparison you know what you're right you're right that makes sense I, i'm just watching this going like why does he have mouth testicles yes he's <laughs> aspiring to be <laughs> thanos i found it very distracting because <laughs> we get you know we get some very uh testicle like chins on a lot of animated characters not often is it the mouth yes it's just really throwing me off that's fair <laughs> But I do, I do like their interplay though. Once they meet up, because like you said, Vandal's been alone this entire time. I'm honestly surprised he still knows how to talk to people. Yeah, yeah, because we we don't know how long it's been since the last human. Yeah, was gone. I would imagine probably also thousands of years. Yeah, right. Yeah, because because the only other time point we have, which I think is a cool reference point, is uh. He said the watchtower was built so well it didn't fall until seventy five years ago. Oh yeah, so that continued to orbit for twenty nine thousand <laughs> more years. I mean, Bruce spends his money well. Yeah, very very well. <laughs> but also, we see that Vandal has set up his own penance because he has the ability to reach out to other worlds, mm-hmm. and he could just go to another planet because we know, obviously, we know other planets exist. Yeah. But he is punishing himself by staying on Earth and staying isolated, Mm -hmm. which I think says a lot about him and his character and kind of his motivation was always to take over Earth. Yeah. And I think I think this is the best we get from Vandal, just because the other two times he's interesting, but he's essentially just a Bond villain. We even talked about it, especially in um, uh, Maid of Honor when it's him in the present period, whereas here he is a weirdly introspective villain. We we get hints of that sometimes from Lex and maybe a little bit from Joker, but they also get so much screen time that they have to kind of push those characters in different directions. But yeah, this is definitely the most like thoughtful, introspective. Um, yeah. Like penitent version of a villain we've gotten so far. Yeah. So, okay. I have a question for you though. Uh, Green Lantern expert that you are. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> what? Okay. What do you think? You don't have to like 
what do you speculate happened with that sector after Earth was destroyed? Do you think they basically just the the Green Lanterns just wrote it off and it's like, well, we're done with Earth. We're just going to start pulling Green Lanterns from other planets. What do you think happened? No, because <laughs> <laughs> the rings would have been sent back to Oa. The second a lantern dies, the ring is sent back to Oa into the Guardians like uh, sanctuary. Yeah. Uh, and they would have recruited another either Earthling or Martian. It could have gone to Martian Manhunter because he's still technically part of the sector. I think he would also I, I think we yeah, assume, he would have. Yeah, because all the league died. Yeah, I think we can assume the entire league or whatever was left of the league died when Savage destroyed the planet. Yes. Yeah. I mean, but they would still need another another being from that sector. So we don't know what other I, I don't. I don't personally know what other planets are in Earth's sector because mm-hmm. it's beyond just our Milky Way. Right. It's a, it's a little bit bigger than that. Okay. Because um, obviously, we know, Abin Sur was part of our sector, and so he, yeah. he would have been from a planet. So we know there's at least one other habitable planet mm-hmm. in the sector. So it would have probably gone to another creature like Abin Sur. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it, it could just kind of be what you said. Earth is now a non-functioning planet. What's mm-hmm. the point of overlooking it when there's no more life to look over? Because they don't really give a shit, right? They're like, well, the planet's dead. Not our problem. We move on. Yes, they're bad space cops. <laughs> <laughs> for, for many reasons now at this point, I think we can say they're just bad space they're cops. bad space cops. But, <laughs> yes. Yeah, because I, I just had that thought as we are talking about it, that it, seemed, it seems odd that no one else would show up at Earth at any point. But I guess if they did, and it's desolate, even if they picked up Savage, they might just be like, nah we don't want to deal with him or maybe they even talk to him and he's like no i want to stay and so they just left it alone but i mean it look it's if you overthink it with anything else in time travel a lot of this doesn't hold up right because obviously the they superman discovers that savage has built himself a time machine the same type of time machine he used to send um a laptop back to world war ii um and this version i guess you can't send back yourself to a point where you already existed which actually would hold with the way the time travel worked in the previous episode in the savage time because vandal himself didn't go back in time he just sent technology right and the rest of the league was able to go back presumably because none of them existed then so i guess i guess that means that wonder woman was born created after world war ii right yeah i never thought i'm just thinking about this now but she's kind of ageless and immortal so I don't Maybe know. Maybe there's something weird about like the Mascarin magic and how it's right. separate from <laughs> time magic. I love how I just said, let's not overthink this too much. And I'm like, wait, what if we overthought this one specific point? <laughs> well, because I mean, with that point, yeah, why doesn't Vandal just send himself another laptop? Yeah, I, I guess. Because he can just continue to keep sending himself messages. I, I, I will say, I think on that point, I bet he realizes that it wouldn't do any good. Because he's had so much time to change his ways. Like, he even says now, like, I realize after all that's happened that what was the point of trying to conquer the world? And I think even he realizes that he, there's no way he could dissuade his former self, his like, his self from the present era from still being a megamaniacal, world-conquering, like, demagogue. I do – yeah, I agree with that. I do have this idea in my head of him sending himself – like aim messages <laughs> so he'll send just like a hey what's up back in time and then like and then in parentheses like hide this under a certain rock in, in <laughs> this sector of the world and he'll like run over and unbury the rock and it's just like not much you yeah can you just get a nice collection of books and just bury them in a desert somewhere for me please yeah thank you okay so so this is this comes into my second question okay about this episode we yeah. see vandal's house mansion estate mm-hmm. lair whatever you whatever word you want to use it's mm-hmm. beautiful it's, it's this kind of infinite cavern mm-hmm. of of time and and kind of uh important things from across history yeah uh and it's we see he has everything mm-hmm. and then we cut to superman sleeping on the couch vandal vandal savage you're telling me you built one bedroom like, obviously, he thinks he's probably the last human. Yeah. But out of courtesy, you wouldn't have a second bedroom. You wouldn't have the tools to construct a second bed. You have him on the couch with <laughs> nothing else in the room. You're a bad host, Vandal. I Wait. Okay. Now that you mentioned this, I don't remember. Did they have multiple play settings? Yes. <laughs> yes. The table was set for four. 
<laughs> Look, okay, I, I, I can say this. You know, you and I both have one bedroom apartments, right? So we have guests over, they sleep on the couch, but we do have multiple sets of di- like dishware. Yes. I mean, I even have an inflatable mattress. Yeah, I guess I do too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> There's options. I like to think that he had a guest bedroom and then discovered like... Oh, I want to go pilfer this sarcophagus from the Smithsonian. So I guess I'm just going to turn this room into another part of my ongoing museum. I, I yes, I agree with that. I think there's <laughs> it's it's the tiny the tiniest bit of bitter <laughs> of like he's never been able to have like one up Superman. Yeah, and this is his only chance. <laughs> his one that little piece of him that's still petty. Yeah, puts him on the couch. He gives him the worst blanket in the house. This tiny little like threadbare thing. Yeah, it's only 200, 200 thread count. <laughs> You're gonna be scratching all night, Superman. But you know that vandal sheets are like the finest sheets imaginable because he, he made them himself over so. decades. decades. <laughs> I mean, there is kind of a fun element of that he keeps alluding to things that he's working on. It's like, oh yeah, like I am working because they have to hunt down this power source to power up the time machines. Like, oh, yeah, I can build another one, but not won't be ready for another fifty years. Because for him, like what does it matter right like i can just do all this stuff i have as much time as i need right all the time in the world to make myself sheets yeah and he and he makes a point of like oh yeah i have to be doing something or else i'd go crazy yeah and so he, he yeah you see these grand projects where he's rebuilt a um what's what's the wow i already forgot all of my dinosaurs uh was the, it a mastodon woolly mammoth oh yeah yeah a fully reconstructed woolly Mel- woolly mammoth skeleton yeah he probably, two. I think there were two of them. <laughs> there were. He probably like he knew some William Mammoths back in the he day. He did. They were yeah. probably his friends. Exactly. It's taken him way, 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 way back. <laughs> but I, I think my favorite part of this whole sequence is when they realize they need to go capture this this energy source. Um, there was a, a line of dialogue, and it was so absurd. I had to write the whole. The, I just want to set the the moment here. I, I, this is what I think the script must have looked like when they created the sequence. The sequence they're flying out there, right? And so I've recreated it here. So. Uh, it's exterior post-apocalypse wasteland night. Superman and Vandal Savage ride the back of giant dragonflies. Vandal Savage. About 30 years ago, some roach creatures broke in and stole my zero point generator. It's the only power source in the world capable of running my time machine. Every single piece of that sequence gets more absurd as you go along. That's the power of Duffy. <laughs> Look, and I'm not criticizing Dwayne McDuffie. He's a fantastic writer. I'm more just pointing out this moment has so many levels of just absurdity to it simultaneously. Like Superman and Vandal Savage riding the backs of flying giant dragonflies to steal a piece of a time machine from giant overgrown cockroaches. Yes. Brilliant. The only sort of stuff you can get in fantastic genre storytelling like this. And also the power source being... A tiny sun. A tiny little sun. How convenient. How convenient that Superman can just hold his power source in his hands. I have powers once again. He falls into a hole. I do love, too, that uh, his powers like are just instantaneous, like a light switch. As soon as there's no sun, they go away. And as soon as there's a sun again, they come right back full strength. Mm-hmm. It's perfect. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it's very convenient that all of a sudden now he has the sun and they can power the machine. He can go back in time and, and, and fix everything. And I think the first half the first part for me is one of the best episodes of all of justice league and i think this is a a nice way of explaining a resolution to that story arc um because he goes back in time and then well i guess first thing he does actually he saves batman from getting shot by deadshot yeah yeah so he he jumps back to the second the rest of the fight that was the end of part one is happening yeah. so everyone is kind of putting bowing their heads in, mm-hmm. in serenity for the death of superman yeah then Deadshot finds his moment. He's going to go all wanted and mm-hmm. shoot through all of them with one bullet <laughs> until Superman catches it. Breaks it apart. And everyone's like, oh, my God, Superman, you're back with this sexy beard. Yeah, with a very nice beard. <laughs> and is that is that red wolf pelt? <laughs> you smell awful, by the way. <laughs> you smell awful. But I, I even like when Vandal says to go back and stop me, you know, go back and prevent me from destroying the world. Um, and you'll find that I'm trying to steal a piece of dwarf star matter from Ray Palmer, which I thought was just a fun little nod. The Atom. Yeah. Who we're going to get soon. Yep. In JLU. Brendan Roth himself. Oh, he's so good in that show. He's so good in everything. He's just great in general. He is. I adore him. Todd Ingram from Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> First and foremost for you. Of course. <laughs> I still think he's great in Superman Returns. 
I do too. I I, I want to go back and rewatch it. Yeah. After I will eventually watch the Donner. I know. Parts as we keep threatening to do at some point. Yes. Well, the Weekly Planet has done it now. Yeah, they were doing it. Yeah. And I want to watch the Caravan of Garbages. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, there. There's a lot to talk about with those original four Superman movies. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. Even the good ones are really messy in their own way. Um. But yeah, good old Brandon Routh. Uh. But yeah, I mean. He's back, and they save the world. That the little stinger at the end is it's the future once again, and Back to the Future style, it slowly starts to to fade into the new reality as Vandal fades out, and it's like, oh, we did it, we did it, we did. I, I would love if it like everything started to form back around him, and then he was just suddenly formed in a jail cell. It's like, <laughs> god damn it, I forgot damn that it. I have to like deal with consequences. <laughs> yeah, and it's like future very like repentant Vandal Savage. Yeah, stuck forever in a prison. Fuck. I didn't plan this. I didn't think this through. I forgot if I do bad things, I'm supposed to go to jail. Right. I mean, and this is his last appearance. It is. Too. So we we actually, at this point, I think, don't know what happens to Vandal Savage after the League stops him. We just know they stop him. But we don't know what happens to him. Mm-hmm. I mean, presumably he's not dead because he can't really be killed. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe they shoved him into a rocket and shot him into the sun or something. That's a little cruel. Yeah. You know, cruel and unusual is, is against our constitutional way. I mean, to the Flash's point, we don't do that to our enemies. It's true. <laughs> so, but no, I, I really, really like these. Um, do you have any other thoughts on like these two episodes? Do you want to talk a little bit about the other versions of the death and return of Superman and how this stacks up? I think we can jump. To, there, there were a lot of great lines in that first part. Mm-hmm. Um, the immigrant from the stars who taught us how to all be heroes. Oh, is such yeah. a good line, especially coming from John. Yeah. Um. I think that's kind of the big one. For what it's worth, I don't think you could have taken. We were talked about that one. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. Let's, let's go into the. Let's go into the other versions of the death of Superman. Okay, so I know you looked up all the different deaths, and you said there were ten of them across ten that I could find. And, okay, yeah, across all media. Okay, so that's spinoffs, movies mm-hmm. that that included the Snyder the Snyder version. Really? I know we don't have to talk about that one. <laughs> um. But I mean, we can start with the the main one, the one that everyone right. knows. We, we'll do a, a super brief history on the 1992 death of Superman. Yeah, which I I think I've read. I think I read at some point years ago. I read the death and return. I mean, that's the most famous one. He's killed in the fight with Doomsday. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in his absence, we see the return of four new Superman to fill the place. So one is John Henry Irons as Steel. One is a clone as Superboy. One is the Eradicator, which is some piece of Kryptonian technology that takes on sentience and tries to fill in the spot. And the last one, of course, is Cyborg Superman, who was actually Hank Henshaw, I think is the name. That sounds right. Yeah, who was an astronaut who was rescued from like some sort of space disaster, but his wife died and he vowed revenge on Superman and somehow he bonded with some technology and pretended to be Superman. It's a whole thing. Um, so that's the one we all know. And then, of course, Superman wasn't dead. He was just in a deep Kryptonian sleep. Yes. Yeah. In all of these. And that, that was kind of the most permanent version of his death. It yeah. Was, he was dead for what, a year. I, yeah, I think it was more or less a year that he was gone. Yeah. Where most of these, it's kind of a single issue. He's dead in his back by the end of the issue. Yeah. And of course, that's the most famous one, because when he reappears, he's wearing the the black suit which i can't remember if it's in that comic or if it was just in other iterations they basically describe it as a a solar suit specifically that it, it absorbs and retains solar energy as he's trying to recharge and get back to his full strength but then how do you describe the mullet i mean the, the that crazy super growing thing that he does is again is that a one day mullet does he constantly <laughs> have to go and give himself a haircut he's the world between every mission he's the world's greatest self-administered barber yeah yeah i mean at least i hope he's donating all that hair i don't think he can it's kryptonian it's hair right he can't i didn't think about oh man that sucks you couldn't cut it but i mean you could make some great indestructible wigs out of it though mm-hmm. so i mean if you or were sweaters yeah Ooh, that's mm. <laughs> <laughs> look i'm not trying to yuck anyone's yum but i think even i draw the line at wearing a sweater made out of superman's hair Maybe that's what Vandal sheets are made of. Oh no! <laughs> He's gone around and just collected no. all the all the singular hairs that have survived the thirty thousand years. 
<laughs> actually that's what the uh the sun was originally intended for like when the little mini sun is gone he can thread them together but then once he brings the sun back it's indestructible mm-hmm. so what he uses to go and hunt the cockroaches it's not a bad plan <laughs> honestly it's not <laughs> it's gross but it's all right <laughs> All right, so that's the most famous. What were some of the other ones, though? Because you mentioned a few ones that preceded that, right, in the comics? Yes, yeah. So uh, <laughs> the first one that I found was 1966 in Superman 188. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, a while ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this one was weird. It, it's similar to what, what's the Kryptonian robot? What did you call him? The Eradicator? The Eradicator, yeah. So it's similar to that. So there's another alien race of like assassins and they're all trying to kill superman and mm-hmm. they basically built from kryptonian remains a superman robot to train against oh okay and one guy named uh Zunil finally became strong enough to defeat the robot mm-hmm. knowing that he can now defeat superman so he travels to earth there's a big fight with him and superman uh, and then the twist at the end is he stabs superman but it's actually the robot that was never dead all along and also flew to earth and took Superman's spot to take the knife. So then Superman could take out Zor-El or (laughs) Zunil. I mean, it's making deep Kryptonian sleep look a lot better. It is. By comparison. It is. (laughs) Um, But then interesting enough, I I found out right before doing this, uh, this episode is loosely based off another Superman story. Oh. Uh, in 1970, Action Comics number 387, mm-hmm. uh, Lex is trying to figure out a way to defeat Superman, and he realized in the current time, he can't. So he creates a time machine to fling Superman a million years into the future, <laughs> where he's sure by that point, an ancestor of his will have created a robot or an android strong enough to defeat Superman. Yeah. So he flings him a million years in the future, and there is a a robot that is hunting him down, Mm -hmm. trying to kill him, but he runs into... uh, The the drone is on the verge of killing the gray-haired and wrinkled elderly Superman when the master healer, another random person, comes in, intervenes, and somehow sends Kal-El back to the very moment that he originally left in 1970. Almost as if he never left in the first place. Almost as if. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Look, I love some great comic book Deus Ex Machina. Yes. So. <laughs> uh, but the one that I want to talk to you about, the weirdest one that I found. Okay. Is, an, is, is a not technically canon mm-hmm. uh, in the DC universe, but it is a great crossover where Superman fights and loses to he-man what and he-man stabs superman <laughs> really the, yeah because the master sword is stronger than his skin and he pierces superman's heart with the master sword <laughs> holy shit it is dc universe versus the master of the universe issue two i'm looking this up right now he-man the power kills... sword, sorry, not the master sword the power sword he-man kills superman uh uh yep yeah there there it is oh this looks relatively modern too i i couldn't find a year for it i didn't look up a year for it yeah i mean the the art style is very modern and it i mean he's in superman's at least in the new 52 design so this looks like it's maybe in the last 10 years or so okay yeah because there was another new 52 death which was even more bizarre okay but this is my favorite version (laughs) i can understand why yeah and so then the (laughs) twist is obviously batman uncovers that it's a big ploy and superman is actually imprisoned um and that this was just kind of a cover-up yeah my god um but no yeah there was another new 52 one i didn't write this one down but i I remember scrolling by it where they wanted to bring in pre-crisis superman into the new 52 oh they gave new 52 superman kryptonite poisoning basically kryptonite cancer and so he died of natural causes and was replaced with pre-crisis superman that does sound familiar yeah because i think it was the new 52 superman was the one that was running around in the the jeans and the superman t-shirt i think so for a long time right and i think they had depowered him too Mm -hmm. like back to more his original specs i don't know man comics are fucking weird yeah (laughs) yeah it's it's interesting to see how many times this has happened yeah and how even more convoluted they can get. 
That's that's really interesting because I, I guess I should have assumed there'd be more deaths of Superman in the comics, but I always just think of the main one, which, you know, it's like a huge pop culture moment too. I mean, it, like you said, he was dead for a year. People thought he was actually dead. And that's what we usually adapted in some capacity in other versions. Um, you know, it's like, I, I think of the versions on screen we've seen, there's the Snyder version, which there's gonna be a whole new iteration of that when the Snyder cut comes out. We're just gonna skip that entirely because it's stupid. But are we? I mean, well, we're, <laughs> we're skipping talking about his death now because okay. it's stupid. <laughs> I was gonna say, because I'm not skipping that I movie. Know. I sadly won't be either because apparently I hate myself. And I just enjoy watching you suffer. That's true. <laughs> I'm a masochist and you're a sadist. It's yeah. perfect. <laughs> so, but in terms of the, the adaptations we've seen, so I think it's Superman Doomsday, the, the first DC direct to video animated movie way back in 2005-ish. Yeah, six, seven, eight or something like that. Way back in the day. Um, there was the death of Superman, and then in combination with that, the reign of the Superman, which came out relative release. Yeah, like two years ago. Yeah, and those were good. Um, and there's this. Mm -hmm. So I think of those like the three animated adaptations we've seen. So And you've seen all of them, right? Yes. So which one do you like, or how does this stack up against the other two for you? Oh, I think it's so different mm -hmm. because the other two were the same story. Yeah. Or I, I like the newer the new 52 doomsday fight mm -hmm. more than the original doomsday fight what was the new 52 doomsday fight the, the, the uh the one that came out two years ago oh I'm, okay yeah because we, we talk about how the modern you know cool modern dc animated films are all oh, in the same continuity I and they're all loosely based off the new 52 looks. I see. okay so you're referring to the the animated movie being the new 52 quote unquote versions of the story, not the the doomsday fight that happened in the new 52 comics. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Got Sorry. It. I guess I, I should be more specific with my words I mean, when everything is connected and we've I, already had the rebirth talk multiple <laughs> times. Honestly though, I should be picking up what you're putting down. Like we're mostly here to talk animation. So, okay. Yeah, that's fair. Yes. This is a lot different. Um, yeah, I, they're so different. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, th I think this is my favorite iteration of the three. Okay. Just because it is something that we haven't seen, at least not since that singular issue in 1970. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, it is a completely new story. Mm -hmm. Whereas we've had the death of Superman story, my, at least my whole life that happened a year before I was born. Yeah. So, you know, we could say that I was reborn with the new age of Superman. <laughs> I wouldn't dare make such a, such a pompous comparison. Which was the greater birth though. I mean, it could have been the same day for all I know. <laughs> I'm not saying one inspired the other. Of course not. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think you're right. Like it's nice that they didn't do a direct adaptation of the death of Superman in the DCAU. They did do something a little bit different, which is pretty normal for them. Like, I think there are ideas they pull from the comics, but they've always put their own kind of twist on it. And I think the nice thing about doing it this way is you didn't have to bring in all of the baggage along with it, too. Like, that's kind of part of the challenge of adapting that storyline is there are certain things you expect to be in there, right? Like, if you're doing the Death of Superman, you expect it to be a doomsday. You expect him to have the black suit and mullet, right? Like, maybe you expect there to be other iterations trying to fill in that sort of space. And if you start excluding some of those elements, it loses something in the process. Um, I think we saw that with the current theatrical version of justice league right that they just kind of bring it back randomly there's not any of the, the fanfare around he's not in the suit um <clears throat> also didn't help that their version of doomsday was super ugly but even even in the superman doomsday animated movie from you know 10 plus years ago and i love that movie i think it still holds up as one of the best yeah even though it was the first one i think it's fantastic um and it's a nice simplified version but I think one of the things it misses out on is seeing how the rest of the league was involved too, because that's a really, it's kind of a pocket story just around Superman. They're not there. And that was one of the things I liked most about the newer adaptation is it was more faithful to the comic in the sense that Doomsday tore through the whole rest of the league first before it got to Superman. And then eventually he died in the process. And so I think it's smart here doing it this way of being its own kind of unique story. Um, and also kind of breaking up into two parts like this too, of having the first half be about the death and aftermath and the second part being this weird journey through the future realm. And, and with that, because we've talked about him a handful of times now, we've already seen doomsday. True. Doomsday has been lobotomized in this yeah. universe already. So they, That's true. they really can't do that yeah. story anymore. 
And I think we even said when we covered um, those two parters, uh, A Better World, we kind of speculated that if the Justice Lords hadn't been there, it would have played out the way it does in the comics. Exactly. Because he was so unstoppable. So, no, I, I, I agree with you. I like this one probably the most of all of them, too. It has the bonus nostalgia points, too. Of, I saw this one as a kid, and I loved this episode, these mm-hmm. two parts here. Um, but no, it is it is really, really good. It's really smart how they handled it. That The one thing that I've still yet to see any adaptation really do um, is I would love to see an extended sequence that focuses on what happens to the world when Superman exists and then is gone. Yeah. And, I, like, you know, I, I think it was even in Red Sun they make reference to the fact in the comic that people just like stop wearing seatbelts, basically like the world kind of just got used to Superman always being around and saving the day. So people weren't as vigilant as they would have been before. Cause like, Oh, well Superman will save us. It's fine. And I would love to see what a, like it done in a movie where, you know, if you're doing the death and return in the movie, focus on his death, it does address in that a little bit of like what happens in a world that has gotten used to Superman. Like what happens when everyone is just used to him being there to save everything and seeing that weigh on him a little bit of like, am I actually causing unintended harm by making everyone's lives easier? Are they no longer fighting for themselves, defending themselves? And then all of a sudden, boom, he's gone. And then the world is just totally fucked and has to reaccommodate. That's something I've never seen done that I would love to see. I can't remember if I included that in my, pitch for a superman reboot on i do remake with sam okay um but i don't know i mean at this point maybe sometime down the line we're gonna get a live action death and return i doubt it considering it's been done and done poorly right and with no mullet (laughs) and with no mullet but mustache (laughs) you you got the wrong m word (laughs) snyder yes Uh, (laughs) i would love to see i would could you imagine though if in the comics he had come back with just a mustache? Yeah, his normal crew cut and spit curl, but then like a big handlebar mustache. I would have loved it. Lobo would have loved it too. He really would have. Like, Lo- did you do that for the main man? <laughs> Superman, I'm, I'm honored. He would have been on board. Uh, but yeah, no, I'd be curious what other people have to say about this too. Uh, yeah, write in and let us know of like those three animated adaptations. Uh, which one's your favorite? Yeah, or or if we forgot to talk about one. I mean, we didn't talk about the, the idea of the death of Superman in Red Sun oh that's true uh, yeah yeah you know, there's a handful of other iterations if you have another one that i just may have missed i only talked about a few mm-hmm. uh yeah what is your favorite version of watching <laughs> the boy scout die your favorite quote-unquote death i had Superman. when i first started collecting comics uh my roommate told me that i had like the most morbid collection because i would specifically get the death of <laughs> books so my collection was because it was but it was alphabetical too so it was yeah all together uh, death in the family death of the family death of Gwen stacy death of superman <laughs> are you just kind of hoping that when we watch the snyder cut it's gonna kill me to add to your obsession <laughs> of death story no <laughs> no because that puts more work on me i know then you know i've stipulated in my will that you have to finish out this podcast without yeah, i'm not me, gonna right? marionette your body <laughs> so we can finish this podcast we could have bernie style <laughs> which doesn't work at all when it's a purely audio medium yeah you just have me like occasionally bump the microphone like I'm here. Like, yeah, I'll yeah. have you type. I'll have your phone go off. <laughs> I mean, you have what, like hundreds of hours now of me talking. You could create like a, a fake AI version of me. that can just come up with any response. Yeah, yeah. I, I can Stephen Hawking's this. Yes. You have plenty of iterations of me groaning as you want to talk about anime to throw in to make it feel like it's real again. That's that's when the audience will know that I've replaced you with the with the AI version. Is when the anime talks stay in the stay in exactly. the cut. <laughs> You'll finally be free, Cameron. I'll finally be free. Hashtag free, Cameron. <laughs> Literally over my dead body is when it'll happen. Yes. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I think since we, we did a little segment there on the um, the various deaths of Superman, I think we're going to forego a question this week and uh, just dive in and note some friends. If that sounds good. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we had we had a lot. We had a lot of responses this week around oh, wow. um, the theme park stuff, especially, too, <gasps> which is cool to get oh, into. My favorite. Um, yeah. So uh, frequent contributor Jake, a.k.a. The Overvoid on a Twitter uh, said, uh, and this is in regards to like spinoff shows actually one of our previous questions is that he would love to see a Martian Manhunter show that gives a reason for why he doesn't use all of his powers. Um, and the overarching villain would be like the aliens from the Just League from your episode or, uh, is it Malefic? Like the evil version of. 
Oh, the one from Doom. Yes. Uh, see him be the Malachi? main villain. No, that's that's uh, Dark Elf. Yeah. Thor. It's hard to keep them straight. I can sometimes. only remember his name when I'm not thinking about of him. Course. Well, he's kind of forgettable. Yeah. Um. Uh. He also would love to uh, or, or have the burning Martians in the show as well, which I guess is like another alien race that burned. I forgot to look that up. Okay. Yeah. Is that also part of Weekend at Bernie's? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> the Bernie Martians. Yeah. I'm here for it. Have you seen Weekend at Bernie's? I've not. We gotta watch it sometimes. It actually, it's pretty fun. I it's it's one of those I feel like I've seen parodied so much. Exactly. I must have seen it. But no, I think those are uh, those are some fantastic ideas there. Uh, yeah. So thanks for writing in, Jake. And then I uh, had a few message uh, from my friend uh, Solomon Sultani on YouTube. He's always writing in with lovely things to say. Um, so one thing you want to point out is that he actually does prefer Justice League to Justice League Unlimited. Interesting. Yeah. So there is someone out there. So there's a lot of people out there. I know. <laughs> All my friends from Dallas. But they had no power this week, so they couldn't write in. Oh, oh, are they doing okay? They're doing okay. They okay. they have had power. They just don't listen. Okay, good. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> I, I wouldn't I would I wouldn't make them suffer anymore. Right. So, uh, but he also wrote in to say that he loved you going through like your gaming tactics to figure out how the league would take down uh, the various members of the secret society. So, um, and then he also mentioned I didn't know about this that I guess at one point. Uh, there was going to be a Gotham theme park um, yeah. built in Universal Studios. And I guess there's a YouTube channel called Pardon Our Dust that did a whole video about it. And I, I only just saw this message right before we started recording, so I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. But do you know anything about that Gotham park? Yeah, so it wouldn't have been the American Universal Studios. I think oh, it was okay. in... Um, oh, God. It wasn't Singapore. Oh, wait, was this... For some part of my brain is remembering like a... a theme park in dubai that's what it is yeah oh, okay. i couldn't get past i in my head i couldn't get past abu dhabi okay no it's in dubai okay, yes they yeah. tried to yeah because they tried to like recreate a bunch of theme parks in dubai oh interesting and all of them flopped oh no i know because oh man they had a they were trying to pitch like a disney world for dubai and it the concept art is gorgeous i bet it was gonna be the biggest castle in the world it was mm -hmm. the the hotel was going to be in the castle oh my god yeah so like the the castle was the back wall of the resort so you yeah. could walk in through the back entrance mm -hmm. uh, or from the front entrance and just see the castle but yeah it looked unbelievable yeah uh but yeah so they were gonna do a gotham park there oh uh, but obviously it, it fell through because yeah. the, the licensing with theme park stuff is very weird mm -hmm. because technically six flags owns all the theme park rights to dc right. properties mm -hmm. and marvel properties are weirdly split where on the east side of the mississippi they're owned by universal mm -hmm. on the west they're owned by disney right it's all kind of fucked up it's very bizarre yeah. yes <laughs> Um, oh that's interesting but it, i i do want to watch that video though because yeah I, i've not seen much into it besides a few pieces of concept art yeah so i'm i'll track down a link to it and i'll I'm, i'll send it to you and then I'll also put it down in the and our plugs in the show notes for people to go check it out but yeah that's super interesting mm -hmm. yeah so uh yeah solomon thanks for uh writing in and let us know about that um and then we also had a message from our dear friend sam gash sam yes happy birthday sam his birthday was i think this week no it wasn't he said happy birthday to me he said happy birthday to you yeah <laughs> wow wow camera sorry did i just shamelessly plug myself you did no judgment no look i need it right now yeah it's all good uh, also um as you saw i you know made the joke on instagram this week for your birthday that i asked green lantern to make you a, a, a cake construct but he refused yep and uh james did write in james trekker did write in and point out that what is a cake but basically just like a series of like beams and plates anyways yeah it's not wrong I mean, if you deconstruct everything yes you can make it happen uh but yeah so sam had some suggestions for uh some just league spinoffs so he suggested the hot girl detective agency the only crime she can't solve is racism uh this is basically just jessica jones but more violent um and hot girl has a villain called monocle who just uh sounds like he would be a total prejudiced motherfucker actually sorry sam said mofo i editorialized okay to motherfucker. is it just doug dimmodome oh the owner of the dimsdale dimatome yes he had a monocle no but a nice top hat oh that's right wait, wait was it a top hat or a 10 gallon hat it was an infinite 10 gallon hat that it just always went to the top of the screen that's right that's right but i think that would be cool actually yeah to see um something focused on hot girl specifically and like what was she up to before she joined the league mm -hmm. um presumably maybe as a detective 
Um, and then the uh, another one was the Martianette, turning the Martian Manhunter into a manhunting Martian. Uh, Martian Manager on a dating show and the villain is Tracy. She'll just stab anyone in the back to get that rose. I'm assuming this is a reference to The Bachelorette. Yes. I don't watch that show. Neither do I. I'm really, though, part of a Bachelorette fantasy league. Or I guess it's a Bachelor fantasy league. And I've never watched the show. Okay. So I just picked people at random and every week I look to see that I'm not winning. Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I do love this idea. <laughs> A dating show based around Martian Manhunter. I mean, he is the loneliest of of the of the league. He is, and he could be anybody. He can be anybody. He could simultaneously be like the uh, like the main contestant, and then all the people vying for his own attention. Exactly. Yes. Um, and then finally, uh, the Doctor is Light. She's a doctor with powers, but doesn't believe in the supernatural. So basically, Doctor Light at the lead in an X Files style show, and her villain is obviously the other Doctor Light, the bad one. Also, happy birthday, Cameron! Thank you, Sam. <laughs> yes. Uh, but thank you, Sam, for those uh, suggestions. And then lastly, here from Ashley Clark, we got a bunch of theme park ideas. Ooh. We we had she and I had a nice run here coming up with some different stuff. Um, but, uh, one, she's disappointed, uh, that we didn't come up with a Riddler escape room. To be fair, you don't usually see escape rooms in theme parks. Well, but you could easily put one in a Gotham park. You can. Yeah. I'm just saying they're usually a separate entity. I know. To a theme park thing. I'm kind of surprised they haven't started doing escape rooms in theme parks. I think they just take up too much time. Yeah. Because if the uh, but, escape room is usually thirty minutes or an hour, yeah, and if you're going to be at Disney for you know twelve hours, I don't want to spend an hour of it not in Disney. Okay, but to be fair, people will spend three hours of it to ride the Cars ride. Yes. So people are perfectly willing to spend time at Disneyland not being on rides. This is true. Yeah, because they don't yes. know the system, yeah. but we do know the system, so we know not to waste time. We we do. Um, but I do like the suggestion um of the uh, Riddler escape room, um, or like a version of Epcot, but a Central City and Star Labs mm -hmm. got a bunch of cool tech in there. Um, she would love to see a ride where you are um like grappling through Gotham City like the Bat Family does, like maybe like a roller coaster or something like that, like dips and flips and stuff like that, which are pretty cool. Um, oh no, this was you disappointed in. We didn't think of, me in particular, Condiment King Restaurant. Of course. It's just, it's just ketchup and mustard. How? <laughs> I mean, how did I not think of a Condiment King-based food thing? Even if it's a hot dog stand, I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed of you, too. Yes. <laughs> uh, but some other ones are Poison Ivy Smoothie Kiosk. Um where you could also buy, like, climate change and environmental charitable merchandise. Which I thought was a really fun idea. Love that. Uh, instead of the Hall of Presidents, you've the history with Vandal Savage. Where you just okay. walk through the history of Earth, which would be super fun. Uh, I suggested, in return, Mirror Master's Mirror Maze. It's good. It's very good. Uh, and then uh, we kind of collaboratively come up with the idea of uh, the Lazarus Pit coffee shop. When you need to pick me up. It's good. Yeah. That's very good. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever been in a Mirror Maze? Yes, I have, actually. They're, I hate it. They're weird. They're I really unsettling. It. It, the only fun part is watching kids slam full speed into mirrors. <laughs> you really are quite sadistic. I, I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a mood today. You really are. Uh, uh, and then the, uh, the last one was uh, a Wonder Woman ride where it's a jet simulation where sometimes you're visible and sometimes you're not with like different dog fights and stuff. That's cool. It's really cool uh but yeah thanks for everyone for writing in uh and then why don't we just wrap things up here with some bat plugs so yeah what do you got for us cameron i i didn't watch a lot of new or digest a lot of new content this week mm -hmm. but for my birthday mm -hmm. it was this week yes happy birthday me happy birthday you um i rewatched a, a classic from high school okay and i'm very curious your stance on this movie and i rewatched fired up I love Fired Up. Okay, good. Yeah, I haven't seen it in years, but I love Fired Up. It, it, I think it holds up. Okay. I love this movie so much. Mm -hmm. I dare say better than Bring It On. I do a lot of hated message on Instagram when I posted that. I did see that. I, here's what I'll say about that. Bring It On, sometimes people forget, is a satire. Yes. Fired Up is not. So the type of comedy is really different. Mm -hmm. Like, Fired Up is more just blatantly goofy, whereas bring it on is simultaneously a send up of 
like that sort of genre of like cheerleader sports films while also being like a very earnest version of one of them. Mm -hmm. So it's like the scream of cheerleader movies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fired Up is so much fun. It is. I still remember almost every line. Not surprised. I, you know, I, I do want to go back and rewatch it again at some point. And I'm curious, having just rewatched it, if what you think about this, because I, I remember one of the problems of that era of comedy, as like the early 2000s, and this is, I guess, a little bit after that. But I'll, most of those movies are very misogynistic and homophobic. Oh, it's very misogynistic. I mean, the whole premise <laughs> of the movie, it's two football players that are tired of going to football camp because there's no girls right. to have sex with. So they go to cheerleading camp instead. So they can have sex with every girl in cheerleading camp. Oh, that's right. And they still end up having sex with a lot of the cheerleaders, right? Oh, almost all of them. Okay. That's okay. Then yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's still, I mean, there's even a great behind the scenes moment because they had all of the like girl extras early on set. Yeah. So they was like this big make out montage where they're all making out with each other. And one of the extras was sick and got every other extra sick, including the two leads. Oh my so they had to pause production for like a week and a half while the, the leads were kind of like healing. That's fantastic. It's just, gross, just, <laughs> but it's hilarious. Oh, that's just great. Uh, but yeah, I mean, as in that, that's why I was curious your stance on that movie, because it mm -hmm. is, it's late 2000s. It's in that bubble of like censoring movies that should have been R to make them PG-13. Uh, to make more money yeah exactly yeah um, it's just yeah curbing some of the really raunchy stuff to make it pg-13 yeah uh but, i mean there is a you know with it being a male cheerleading movie there is an overarching sense of like homophobic jokes okay but they, they're i don't want to they're not subtle is not the right word that's the, the opposite word i want to use they they don't address it up top they kind of do I want you to watch the movie. Okay, I, I remember them having a really good bromance. And what I remember of it is that they are just very comfortable with each other and it didn't ever feel like it was making fun of, like, homosexual connections. Yeah, cause, yeah, because there's one... There's there's two gay guys in the movie. Yeah. One of which is, is kind of the very stereotyped. Yeah. Uh, and the other one is, I guess, subtle... Where the, the main guy is just so into himself, he doesn't realize that there's another guy also into him. He's oh. like, he's just like, yeah, he just treat me like I treat myself. Like, what do you mean? Oh, I do kind of remember this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a little bit of the butt of the joke. Okay. I'll rewatch it at some point. Yeah. Give a, a modern perspective on it. Uh, but then on the flip side of that, I started rewatching Phineas and Ferb. Oh, okay. And it is delightful. I've heard great things. It's so good. The music in it is spectacular. It's one of those... Uh, kids shows where every episode has a has an original song mm -hmm. and they're like spectacular they're okay. so good nice i'm probably not gonna watch it that's okay but i can appreciate your the love premises for are great there's one where they want to become a one-hit wonder band <laughs> they, they follow the rules of what it means to be one-hit wonder having a song where the chorus is just made up words that mm -hmm. mean nothing yeah so it's gitchy gitchy goo means i love you fantastic they have to do a concert they have to sign with a big record deal and then uh, tear up the contract, break up, and they know they've made it when their song becomes an elevator song. It's <laughs> great. And I'm like, they, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's pretty much. That's more or less the plot of that thing you do. So, exactly. Yeah, they got it. Yeah, just it's it's a very comforting show. Okay. Even if I don't, even if you don't have the nostalgia value, I think right. it's still just like a warm positive light that i need right now nice okay uh what about you what have you been watching listening reading uh i listened to the second season of the wolverine podcast on stitcher so the okay. um the first one was wolverine the long night and the second one was wolverine the lost trail um and so the first one's set in alaska um and the second one is set in new orleans and it's really good um i think i actually think i like the second season a little bit better Initially, it was just up on Stitcher Premium. I think now it's available pretty much on any podcast platform. Um, but this one is more focused on him. Like the, the first season was more from the perspective of two agents trying to hunt him down. And so Wolverine was kind of a background character. Right. And part of the mystery. Whereas in this one, he's a protagonist. And he teams up with like a local kid to try and track down a bunch of missing people. X-23? No, it's not X-23. Oh. No. But what I liked about this one is um, it had much it had a lot more mutant cameos in it. 
But the, kind of interesting about the first one, and this isn't really quite a, a spoiler, but it really doesn't touch on like mutants and X-Men, anything else like that at all. It's, it's almost like it's an entirely different story that happens to have Wolverine as a character. And towards the end, you get a few more little nods here and there to some more common X-Men elements. Um, but here in this one, like the disappear, like part of the people disappearing are mutants. It's like, Oh, the whole thing. And there's an actual element of, you know, um, like bigotry towards mutants specifically. And there's some cameos in there. Um, and, it's in the credits in the first episode for even to meet the characters. It's not really a spoiler to say the one of the supporting characters is Gambit <gasps> too. Our favorite. Yeah. Which is pretty fun. So I, I really liked it. I thought it was a, a nice um, kind of pocket story in that universe, but this one touched on the broader X-Men universe a little bit more. And so I appreciate it for its, it's little nods and connections there. Got it. Um, good storytelling overall, really solid. So I listened to that this last week. Uh, and then I read the comics we brought up last week on the podcast. So, um, messenger of murder by Bernie Gonzalez. Oh, that's right. I read them. Cause I, I looked at the art cause you would, you remind me of them during the episode and the artwork was right. And I read through them and they're really, really fun. They're really good. Um, you know, as we mentioned last week, the art is very like halfway between Darwin cook and Bruce Tim. Um, and it's just like super fun, like pulpy murder mystery. Mm-hmm. That basically the people are getting killed and there appears to be this, um, mysterious wraith kind of character who basically looks like Jack the Ripper, but he's just purely red. Um, and so it, it kind of plays in that space too of like, oh, is it super rational? Is it real sort of thing? And it the artwork and the style perfectly matches the tone of the whole thing. I had a lot of fun with it. That's great. They're really, really good. Um, yeah, and so we're, we're giving a bonus shout out here to Bernie again this week because they're they're great comics. I recommend them. So I'll put them in the show notes uh, again this week. So yeah. definitely check them out. And they're they're short. Like, it's two volumes. I think they're, like, 32 pages each or something like that. Okay. Like, really nice, tight, concise storytelling. So Yeah, I mean, that's that's still, you know, a lot of work for a one-man oh, one yeah. band. So, no. like, huge props to you, Bernie. It's – honestly, it's incredible. Like, it – I felt like – and I absolutely mean this is a comment. I felt like I was reading a published comic that I had picked up off the shelves. That's awesome. Like, the, the artwork is so gorgeous. The storytelling is so good. Like, it is on par with – stuff that I've been reading for years, better than some stuff I've been reading for years. So nice. Yeah. So huge, huge plug for that. So, but yeah, I think that's it for this week. We did it. I know we, we have made it through the death return of Superman again, multiple, multiple times over. <laughs> multiple times over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, if you uh, have thoughts on these episodes or if you want to let us know what your favorite version of the death Superman is, uh, write into us and let us know. We're at Tim talk pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Gmail. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, and I am at Lord of on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. If you want to see my face, you can find that at Cameron Dexter underscore adventures. And if you want to see my art, you can find that at Cameron dot Dexter. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Well, we'll be back next week, uh, closing in on the end of justice league here. Mm. So we have wild cards, which is the return of Joker, but also the canonical, I guess we'll call it premiere of the Royal flesh gang. Yay. Two. Um, and we'll get to it next week, but there's, uh, some voice cameos in that episode camera that you in particular are really going to appreciate. Is it when it's the, the teen Titans? Yes. <laughs> Good. Yeah. <laughs> no fooling you. <laughs> Uh, but really looking forward to those. I haven't seen them since they aired, but I remember them being a lot of fun. I just remember the voices. Of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll bring my, my deck of cards and I'll do magic tricks. Perfect. While we talk about the Royal Flush Gang. Yes. Just the sound of cards shuffling. <laughs> uh, but thanks everyone for listening. We'll see you next week. Yep. Stay warm, everybody. Yes. Stay warm. Uh, yeah. For those of you who are in the middle of the country and dealing with that horrible storm, uh, wishing you the best. Hope you're doing okay. Yes. So Thanks, guys. Thanks. Uh, bye. Ba 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 ba.